put one of these. I must say I've been on the other side of the fence um, for a few of these, and they've all been very, very interesting. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is talk about two of my great loves, and um, really what I've done at NASA since I got there, and I won't even say when because it's too embarrassing. I'm looking around the room to see if anyone you know, wasn't even born before I got there. Um, and um, show you sort of how we're combining them in, in kind of an interesting way. So, as Pierre mentioned, um, I started a program in synthetic biology at um, NASA about um, eight years ago. And you're probably asking, what is synthetic biology? And in sort of a very simplistic way, um, it's making something that's new using biology. So you can think about synthetic chemistry as making something that's new that's useful to us. Well, synthetic biology is making something new. And there are a lot of people, actually world leaders at Stanford, um, also at Berkeley, um, Imperial College, a couple of really big centers around the world. And most of them are focused on changing the metabolic capabilities of organisms, making fuels and um, drugs and so on. Um, at NASA, we're interested in all those things, but we are mostly interested in taking them and using them in space. There's no reason, um, once you're using these applications on the Earth, that you can't also use these on Mars and Moon and beyond. Um, so that's sort of the synthetic biology bit. And then there's the astrobiology bit, um, which is sort of where my heart is. And I think probably if anyone here has heard of astrobiology, the tendency is to think of it as, as hunting for little green men. But it's something actually a lot richer than that. Um, I'm an evolutionary biologist by training. And so to me, astrobiology is really the most liberating thing I could do as an evolutionary biologist. We're focusing on three really big questions that I believe are some of the oldest questions that, that mankind has asked. And these are, where do we come from? And not just, you know, did you come from Connecticut or, or you know, the North Pole or wherever, but where do we come from as humans? Where do we come from as living organisms? How do we end up with the um, chemical um, environment so that life could start? How do we end up with a habitable planet all the way really back to the Big Bang? So it's the where we come from in a very rich way. The mirror image is where are we going. So just because we're here doesn't mean that the sun has stopped burning or the moon hasn't stopped moving away from the earth and so on. So it's what's going to go on in the future, again, in a physical, biological, chemical context. And then the last bit is, is life universal? Are we really alone in the universe? So what I'd like to do today, tonight, is focus on how you marry these two really grand um, disciplines, meta-disciplines, into something interesting. So um, I could go on and on for hours and hours and hours, and my daughter's in the room and she can verify the fact that I can go on for hours and hours and hours. But I won't do that to you, and in fact I can't because, um, because I'll be cut off. So we're going to focus on two big questions tonight. Um, can't hear the you. Can't hear you. you can't hear me. Wow. I. I sound like I'm screaming. Is, is it not really focusing? Okay, because it really sounds very loud from where I am. Is that better? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, so now I can't hear. <laughs> Sorry about that. Glad you said something. So what we're going to do is focus tonight on just two examples of things that my lab is doing to combine this synthetic biology and astrobiology. And the first really focuses on this um, where do we come from question, and looking at the language of life. And the other one is the are we alone? And this will be on artificial extremophiles. So this will be kind of fun. So I, I would like to start by saying that actually I'm a little jealous. When I got to NASA, and I, I will admit it, I got to Ames in, in 1987 after the Viking missions. And I thought that these planetary scientists really had a bum deal because they really didn't get anything new to publish about unless there was a mission going up. Whereas as a biologist, I could go into the lab every day and this is my diary. Okay, so before 1988, we were pretty much even. Um, there was one known solar system and there was one known life form. So you couldn't do comparative work on solar systems, you couldn't do comparative work on life. But as of last night, I didn't update since last night, sorry, there is still only one known life form, but there are 1,127 planetary systems known. So can you imagine if I could stand up here and say, I know of 1,127 different life forms, and two-thirds of them do this, and one-third of them do this, and some of them do that, it would be an incredibly rich, exciting talk. 
but we don't have that. We still have this one. So we know about these different planetary systems from missions like Kepler, which you've probably heard about. It's one that's run out of NASA Ames. These are the planetary systems that have been discovered by the Kepler mission as of last February, well, February 2014. So you can imagine now how rich that is. And here we are still stuck with this one life form. So we have to look at the life form that we do have and try to understand as much as we can about its diversity, about its origin and evolution, but still remind ourselves it would be like reading one book and claiming that we know everything about literature. We don't. So one thing that we can do is try to actually create new life forms in the lab. Um, and you can do that um, partially by trying to follow a path that was already there in the early Earth, or by trying something completely different. And so, for example, we have now on Earth-based life use DNA, basically as our coding um, information system, and then RNA is used in a whole lot of ways, but basically it's used to transfer this information from the DNA into proteins, the proteins make DNA. So you sort of have this circular thing, and many people think that RNA came first, there was an RNA world, and this is because RNA can both code for information, but it can also act like an enzyme. Bad luck here. Um, but there are a whole lot of problems with the RNA world. Again, I, I can't spend all night explaining them, but suffice it to say that one of the big problems, as far as I'm concerned, is that if you go out into space, if you look between the planets, solar systems, and the galaxies, you don't see these building blocks for RNA. When the meteorites come and so on, you don't see RNA. But actually what you do find, which is kind of interesting, is you find amino acids. And so here are all these problems, which this is an evening lecture, it's the summer, so we won't go through all those, there's no exam at the end. Um, but suffice it to say that we've now started to focus on the idea that you can start with amino acids. So has everyone in the room seen Apollo 13? Great movie, there's a scene in it where um, they, the engineers throw all the stuff on the table, the duct tape and so on, and say, this is what you've got to make a CO2 scrubber. That's exactly how I imagine the origin of life. All the stuff's on the table, and you know what? It would be great to use RNA and stuff, but it's not there. You've got the duct tape, you've got the, you know, the twist and so on. And the duct tape and so on that was there in this prebiotic world was amino acids. And so if you go to meteorites, stardust analogs, prebiotic experiments, hydrothermal vents, and so on, you find amino acids. And even more than that, you find them in a certain pecking order. About the first 10 you find out in nature that we use, the other 10 or so we make ourselves. So you can start to think, well, what was there were these amino acids in this sort of order? And so what if we just start with those and try to recreate a life form only using what was there? And so at this point, we've done a little bit of that. We've had this enormous library that we're starting to test. One proof of concept that was done in my lab in the last year, which was actually a senior honors thesis from Stanford, was looking at one of those particular amino acids, um, cysteine. Now it turns out cysteine is made from serine. Serine is already there, but cysteine isn't. But the enzymes that make cysteine use cysteine. So you're back to another chicken and egg problem. And so what Kendrick was able to do was change those enzymes that made cysteine so they no longer use cysteine. So you were able to prove that it was possible to get out of this chicken and egg problem. And again, we're now working on that with the whole central dogma. Um, turns out there are all sorts of other amino acids you see in meteorites and so on, many of which um, we don't use. And so that's been another question in our lab, why don't you use them? So those are some of the sort of very quick, wild things that you can do with synthetic biology and the origin of life. But now we're going to focus more on the sort of where do, are we alone in the universe? And so to do that, there are a couple of sort of easy steps. It's not actually as, as difficult as you might think. First of all, you have to know what you're looking for, and that could take hours to talk about, you know, what is life? Um, what do you think life is in a, in a sort of general concept versus Earth-based? So you have to sort of know what you're looking for, and again, the, only, the problem is that we only have one example of life, and that's planet Earth. So then you have to use all the knowledge you have about planet Earth. What are the limits for life on the Earth? To get some idea what the limits might be for life elsewhere. And then you might look to see where the habitats are elsewhere and where this overlap might be. 
And then you might want to go find the life. But at the same time, you may not be able to find anything. You may not be able to go because the missions haven't been funded or the, the sophistication is too great for our current, I hate to say technology because I really do keep getting back down to our current budget. And so one thing you might do is actually try to make new life forms the way I was talking about a moment ago or tweak the ones we have so that you can say, not that the life form I have in my lab is what you would find on Venus or that you find it anywhere else besides my lab, but that it's at least possible for life to live <coughs> under these unusual conditions. So NASA uses sort of this basic rule of thumb, follow the water, and if you do that, sorry, I'm not sure what this is request. You can start, well, We'll talk a little, we're not going to talk about Mercury at all. It's too hot and dry. We'll get back to Venus. We know that life on Earth is there. We know Earth is heavily infested with life. Just look around the room. Um, we could go to Mars. Mars is a situation where um, we thought for a long time there might be life there for various reasons. The Mariner missions in the 60s um, set back these photographs that show clearly that there's no life um, at least on the surface, there's certainly not a dying civilization. Mars is much smaller than the Earth. Um, I think somewhere I have a, a pointer in the middle. So here's, here's the Earth, and here's Mars, Venus, Mercury, and so on, and then the big guys. So it's a little bit smaller. It wasn't able to hold its atmosphere. It's a little farther away from the sun. It got cold and dry, possibly life early on, possibly still there. Ceres is now just sort of hitting our radar screen. It's the largest asteroid, the asteroid belt, it's possible that it's got liquid water, so always a possibility for life. Um, you can then start to go out into some of these other moons, like Europa, which is one of the moons of Jupiter. Um, it's of enormous interest because it looks like it's covered by ice and has liquid water ocean under the surface, and in fact we see organic carbon there, so all the building blocks for life very cool. This is not a photograph of Europa. This is an artist's conception. This is what we dream about at night. Someday we will have a mission that goes through the ice and we look and we see organisms and we're all extremely happy. Um, here's Enceladus. Enceladus does not park itself over the United Kingdom. In fact, this is again not a photograph. This is for scale. Another tiny moon, but this time of Saturn, again, bright white. We think it's ice with liquid water under it, possibility of life. Titan, lots of organics, water, but it's solid because it's, again, off the, off the coast of Saturn. Here's a photograph from um, Titan. But again, potential for life, um, potential for life um, all over. Here's Enceladus again, just showing the water coming out and the various molecules potentially Pluto, potentially beyond Pluto. You see all these bright white objects. So there are all these places, even within our own solar system, that are at least potential for life. But the, and there is some overlap with the life we have here. Um, but it's not as good as one might hope for. You know, I just sort of danced through all these planets and moons and said maybe, 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 maybe. But when you get down to the nuts and bolts, like, you know, seriously, it's colder than the Antarctic, or it's more acidic, or it's more this. <laughs> So what if, again, we just go into the lab and make some artificial extremal files? So I have a group of students that comes into my lab every summer. Um, it's a competitive synthetic biology competition. And because of having appointments at Stanford and Brown, I've been the faculty advisor for combined Stanford-Brown team. And in 2012, they looked specifically at this question um, of making an artificial extremal file. They called it the Hell Cell Project, which I thought was great. We use that now all the way up through the White House. Everyone thinks it's a great title. And so here's give you an idea of what these kids look like. They're very bright, very enthusiastic, and do fabulous things. So this was actually one out of three projects they did, which they won all sorts of awards for. So what they just they came to me at the beginning of the summer and said, um, if we put each of these genes in E. coli, which is this sort of garden variety, wimpy um, bacterium, we will give it all these superpowers. And you look at a list like this, and um, you know, I'm old enough to think, wait a minute, that's one, two, three, four PhDs there. There is no way you're going to do this by the end of the summer. But I have learned dealing with incredibly bright students that you don't say no, because they'll only you know, try to prove that you're wrong anyway. So I said, <laughs> sure. And um, sort of cut to the chase, they put every one of these genes on this list in E. coli, 
and we're able to show some increase in its superpowers by the end of the summer. Let me give you one example um, with desiccation here. So drying these things out. We use water for life, so you need water. So here in the control um, E. coli, and they're not very good in the face of drying out. And here was with a, a certain sugar um, operon, tremolose biosynthesis, and you can see an increase in desiccation resistance. Look what happens when they add the glycine beta E pathway and then the manganese transporter. So in a very simplistic way of just adding a single gene or a single group of genes, they were able to take E. coli and make it much more durable. So it gave us enormous confidence that making synthetic extremophiles may not be all that difficult. Now, you know, this isn't perfect, but it just, it shows that this is a direction that could be really interesting because again, remember, I'm jealous that the planetologists have all these planets and so on they can talk about. We still only have this one life form, so we have to make it. So um, I think what I'm going to do is finish um, with another project from that 2012 team, which ties it all together. So instead of health cell in a generalized way, they specifically asked the question, could we make an organism that lives um, on Venus? Now, in fact, living on Venus is, on the surface today is impossible. The atmosphere pressure is about 90 atmospheres. On the Earth, it's one atmosphere. So this is literally bone crunching. 450 degrees centigrade. Remember, water boils at 100. pH is zero, so this is more acidic than your stomach. 300 mile per hour winds. Someone offers you beachfront property on Venus. Do not take it. This place is literally hellish. But four and a half billion years ago, and potentially as recently as half a billion years ago, um, there was a Venus that was much more like the Earth. So liquid water, oceans, probably organic compounds, and so on. But what happened is Venus is a little closer to the sun as the water started to evaporate and went into the atmosphere. Water's a great greenhouse gas, so it made the surface hotter. So there was even more evaporation. You get this positive feedback loop. Um, and you end up with a Venus that is hellish like it is today. But if the surface of Venus was similar to the Earth for potentially as long as four billion years, and life arose well within that time, and probably arose within the first couple of hundred million years after the Earth arose, um, it's quite possible that life arose on the surface of Venus. And then as this runaway greenhouse effect took over, the life could potentially have gone up into the clouds. This was something suggested by Carl Sagan um, in 1967. Because if you go up in the clouds, it's about one atmosphere pressure like the Earth between zero and 100 degrees centigrade, lots of sun, nutrients, and so on. This is a great idea. The problem is, we know there are organisms in our clouds, but if anyone here has ever seen a cloud that's green or orange and so on, please let me know, because I haven't. We know there are organisms up there, but we haven't been able to prove that any of them can complete a life cycle, which is what would be required to live on Venus. And every time I try to think of a way to outsmart it, I do work with the Aero Astro Department here, for example, in ballooning, catching an organism that might be dividing, you could always sort of talk yourself off of this and say, well, maybe there was an organism dividing that was lofted up into the clouds. So I finally came to the conclusion the only way to test this was using synthetic biology. So what these students did is they took two genes that are absolutely required for cell division. The um, ribonucleotide reductase and DNA polymerase. Don't worry about what they exactly are. Just remember that they are critical for cell division. And so what they did is they cloned these. And then they attached a GFP marker. So this is um, a marker that's green and fluorescent. So when these genes are activated, the cells basically flash you know, green fluorescent light. And so here's some micrographs of the cells with these reporters. And here they are um, showing green. So basically, at that point, the only thing left to do, and I'm pleased to say we have another discussion with um, people involved with the space station yesterday, is actually fly this. So probably take a marker that's a little bit easier to detect. Um, usually the punchline of the science stories is, you know, we could do all this great stuff if we had more money. As it turns out, the punchline for this is we could do all this great stuff if we could get rid of gravity. And so that's the last thing to really test whether organisms can divide while they're in an aerosol for long periods of time. So um, I know that, that this is sort of a lot. Um, I'll just finish by saying that a lot of what we are doing with the synthetic <coughs> biology 
um, at NASA Ames is really looking at the issue not of astrobiology, which is what I'm talking about and where my heart is, but human settlement. And that is also a totally, you know, different and, and equally, um, well, it's not equally fascinating, let's be honest, but it is, <laughs> it is fascinating, you know, for those of you who like, you know, going to Mars. Um, there are all sorts of needs we have, there are all sorts of challenges, and synthetic biology um, will probably provide the answer for a lot of that. Just like on Earth, we use organisms to do chemistry, whether it's beer or making um, fuels or pharmaceuticals or whatever. There's no reason not to do it on Mars. There's no reason not to take materials we bring from the Earth or we mine from Mars or we pick up an asteroid and then start to make buildings and um, clothes and so on and so forth. Um, habitats, synthetically altered organisms, um, with alternate biochemistries, maybe to do all sorts of you know random things for us, um, including potentially making electricity. But again, that's another story, but that gives you another little hint of, of how we can combine astrobiology with the where are we going question. And so with that, I will finish as we do at NASA by saying add astro to the stars, and thank you very much.